but you also have to be a monster. Today we are going to discuss the psychology of social dominance using a clip from the TV show Jack Reacher. We'll cover two key components at the heart of every dominance attempt. You need to understand both if you want to know how to be more socially dominant. In this scene, Jack Reacher has been unjustly locked up in jail with an accountant. We'll see a man enter the jail cell who starts to establish dominance on the accountant. If you want to understand dominance in this scene, pay attention to who seems to own what. If I were you, I'd be less worried about their sentences and more concerned with their swaps. Swaps? Guys swap desserts, TV time, all for first crack of you. You're not a human in here, you're currency. Psychologists created a questionnaire to measure something called social dominance orientation. Social dominance orientation is a type of personality trait. People with this trait believe some are inferior. Situations where some are on top and others are on bottom are inevitable in life. Trying to change this won't work. Those high on social dominance orientation will often use aggression, violence, intimidation, and threats to increase the perceived social gap between themselves and others. We see this immediately in this clip where the inmates are bartering for access to the accountant. They see him as lesser. He is a product to be traded for and owned. This mental separation is the foundation of social dominance and the first key. Instead of looking at someone as their equal, dominant people often look at others as lesser. Other people work for them or exist to serve their needs. They own everyone. To get in this frame of mind, picture them working for you. Hit the like if you'd like YouTube to find more videos like this one. This mental mindset of ownership leads to the next two behaviors we see, their verbal aggression and physical positioning. In the next part, pay attention to the crafty action the inmate takes with the man's glasses. What message does it send? She ready. Look, she got pretty little shoes on. Give my shoes like a good little bitch. I said, give them to me. Good girl. Like my glasses too. Give my glasses. Verbal aggression plays many roles in dominance. Some studies have found that those who were more verbally aggressive were seen as leaders. Studies also found that there were certain ways of typically expressing verbal aggression. They included comments on the mood of the room, comments about the person's appearance, mockery, threats, and criticism. Successful aggression and dominance are so connected that in many places in the literature, those terms are used interchangeably. The inmate expresses this verbal aggression in a few ways. He says, isn't she pretty? A clearly demeaning comment. This man doesn't respond and instead keeps cowering. So the prisoner keeps taking and demonstrating his ownership. Give me those shoes, baby, little bitch. This string of insults and requests is meant as a further test. Will the accountant respond when someone is clearly taking something that's his? Even the rewarding comment given by the prisoner at the end is an insult. He says, good girl. Remember to keep listening to learn the second key to social dominance. Verbal aggression doesn't have to be confined to insults. It can also take place in a more mild and actually socially acceptable form. For example, in debate. Consider using the devil's advocate approach in conversations. Figure out what the other person is arguing, disagree, critique what they are saying, and argue the other side. This establishes you as someone who is willing to call out mistakes. It gives you a sort of social threat that underlines all conversations with you. If they don't think about what they're going to say, you'll make them look dumb. We also see a man take up more physical space as the scene goes on. He moves from the doorway of the cell to the center. Since the cell is a sort of home for prisoners, this man is displaying ownership as he moves to the center place of the room. Studies show that subtle things like seating arrangement in meetings can actually affect perceptions of who is in charge. One study found that when a person sat at the head of the table, others perceived them as more dominant. Furthermore, when no leader was clearly defined in the group, the members attributed leadership to the person sitting at the head of the table, almost as if by default. When you enter a room, consider standing in the middle and taking up space. This might just tip the cards in your favor. The inmate finishes off by requesting the accountant's glasses. He spits on the glasses and then crushes them. This is a message showing that he is going to take whatever he wants, even if he doesn't value it at all. You need this badly, I took it from you, and I don't even need it. That's how much more power I have. 
This reinforces the sense of ownership and the power imbalance. He's gaining more power by demonstrating his existing power. In the final part, watch how Jack Reacher responds. How many of the inmates' techniques does Jack Reacher end up using? You're in my house, fatso, and you didn't ask permission. So you and your friends can leave now, or they can carry your fat ass out in a bucket, bitch. Do you know who you're talking to? One, two. You owe us a pair of glasses. Now get out. We see Reacher immediately do two things. First, he counterclaims the space. Then he insults the man and tells him to get out. This is one of the keys to breaking someone's frame and retaking control. He perpetrates a small act of defiance. This defiance sends the signal that he's willing to fight over the disagreement. Earlier, we advised playing the devil's advocate. Disagreeing with someone at least once in a conversation is an excellent way to perpetrate a small act of defiance. This is especially true if you can find a legitimate weakness in their line of thought. Moreover, his insult is a specific form of criticism. The study we referenced earlier spoke about the different ways leaders are verbally aggressive. One of them is criticism. Leaders stand for progress and don't tolerate anything less than perfection. By calling this man fatso, Reacher is pointing out how the man falls short of the masculine ideal. His physical appearance implies he isn't competent. In contrast, Reacher's stature implies a certain level of discipline and competence. Why should he listen to someone who's clearly so unskilled in a relevant area? Yeah. Next, the man tries to respond by using a question to take control of the conversation, but Reacher ignores the question, maintaining his frame, and starts counting down. We won't go into frames much in this video, but know that whoever is responding isn't the one in control of the frame. Reacher isn't responding. Keep your frame in a conversation by ignoring the other person's question and instead stubbornly carrying on. This physical altercation tips us off to the heart of any dominant situation, punishment. Every attempt at dominance must also have a realistic threat of punishment attached, even if it is unspoken. That's why people listen to their bosses. The boss can fire them. Children listen to their parents because the parents can take things away. Punishment is the main key to social dominance. Finally, after demonstrating his physical prowess, Reacher makes the sidekick give him a pair of glasses and dismisses them. This completes the dominance exchange. Reacher is marked as the person who is in charge. He owns the area. More importantly, he has the willingness and ability to punish in order to maintain that ownership. There are two categories for achieving social status in the literature, we just spoke about dominance, which is using force and intimidation to climb the ladder. If you want to know more about how to be dominant using insults, check out the video on the psychology of insults